hello. Welcome to this edition of Good Evening Ghana. Thank you very much for your time. Tonight, uh, well, first I have to apologize for starting late. It will, it will not happen again in this Christmas season. Welcome to another Christmas edition of Good Evening Ghana. Tonight, um, we have a book review. We're going to have a, a long and interesting conversation with Kojo Yanka. Kojo Yanka is the author of the book entitled The Trial of J.J. Rawlins. Um, and uh, he's doing a part two of the book. There's actually a drama event that uh, Mr. Yanka and his team have put together showing in Accra on the 31st of December at the National Theatre. Tonight, we're going to talk to him about that book, and um, it's part of an important part of Ghana's political history. So, of course, politicians um, should be interested in this one. And uh, we will talk about the book. As you know, a few weeks uh, ago, we interviewed Mrs. Rawlins, and um, Mrs. Rawlins talked a little bit about J.J. Rawlins and the trial. We are not so sure why Kojianka is preparing for the part two and what the part two will say. But uh, those of you who don't know Mr. Yanka, he's a seasoned politician, former member of parliament, former minister of the Ashanti region, and former minister of information in the critical periods of Ghana's political history. Mr. Yanka will join us in the studio for that conversation. He's also a member of the National Democratic Congress, as you know. And so perhaps we'll steal the occasion to ask him a few questions about the NDC. Of course, you remember that recently he put up a, a social media post advising President Mahama, and uh, he took the bashing for it from Mr. Mahama's people. That's not our concern for tonight, but I'm just telling you that Kojenka will be in the studio. So as we always do, we might steal time and occasion to ask him some questions. When we come back from the, uh, the break with the Palma Choir, I'll be addressing an issue just for five minutes with uh, a certain Dr. Osai, whom I had spoken to this afternoon, actually invited him to be on this program. But Dr. Osai and I had an argument on, on phone over his assertion in Article 66 of the Constitution that all the presidents who have ever participated in the presidency in Ghana, including Fly Lieutenant Rawlings, and the, and the um, recently celebrated 80-year-old J.A. Kufour, and indeed Mr. Mahama, can all uh, vie for the presidency again. We had a conversation on phone, and um, I invited him to the studio. As it turns out, he hasn't turned up yet, but I will... Uh, share with you what we said and then uh, tell you my views on the matter just before Kojianka comes. So it's a fully political discussion uh, here on Good Evening Ghana tonight with me. Uh, my name is Paul Adumocha. After the break, we'll be back with the opinion on Dr. Osai's views and then a very long book review. This is the book, uh, The Trial of uh, J.J. Rawlins, as you can see on your screen, and uh, we will be dealing with it um, by Mr. Kojianka. Lots of questions will come up. It promises hopefully to be quite interesting. Here is the choir reminding us that we are close to Christmas. Show up, look sharp, look sharp. Or look and you see, say maybe so I 
Feco Spray Starch makes ironing easier and faster. There's no clogging and it protects your fabric from stains. Fresh smell, big can, and you go use them, sir. See the difference. Feco Spray Starch. Look sharp. Shady rumor to me. And mosquito fell. And I told Master, a bay year to one of them. He's so mad that Roma insecticide spray at that Roma. Enter Fred, enter Tia, make a chair. No way. You make no, and don't turn back or crown funnel. And also, I am poor with you. Roma insecticide spray and mosquito fell. And I would dare we a shout. Roma, don't cry. And Tonto Master. The fans have voted for the BBC African Football of the Year 2018. Will it be towering defender Mehdi Benatia, defensive dynamo Khalidou Koulibaly, supersonic Sadio Mane, midfield maestro Thomas Poiti, or star striker Mohamed Salah? Find out who will lift the trophy this year when Focus on Africa reveals the winner of the BBC African Footballer of the Year 2018. Live on Metro TV. Welcome back to the show. Okay, I didn't have my spectacles at the beginning of the program, so I was a bit disheveled, but now I'm fine. And uh, thank you very much for your patience. Okay, so tonight we have an exclusive interview with Kojo Yanka. He's going to tell us about um, the event that he's putting up on, um, on 31st December at the National Theatre. We do have a trailer for the event that we'll show you during the program sometime. Mr. Yanka was the, is the author of uh, this book, uh, The Trial of J.J. Rollins. Maybe we have the book. We can put it up on the screen for you to see. It's entitled... The Trial of J.J. Rawlings, Echoes of 31st December Revolution uh, by Kojo Yanka. Okay, so that's on the screen now. Uh, that he's, this is the first volume of the book, and he's put up a second volume. But what he's doing on the 31st of December in commemoration of the revolution event at the National Theatre is to put this in the form of drama and music. That promises to be a thriller, but he'll tell us more about it. I have taken up some portions of the book that I'd like to ask him about. And also be asking him tonight whether the whole 31st and the whole Rollins thing turned out to be a positive or a negative for Ghana. It's part of our Christmas conversations here on Good Evening Ghana. We're going to have a few of these as the year draws to a close and as we reflect on the future of our country. So it's book review tonight. Let's get down to business and uh, talk about Dr. Osai. News uh, on online media, on Ghana Web, CT Online, apparently it was first said on CTFM by Dr. Osai is that his understanding of uh, Article 66 of the 1992 Constitution is that people who have already been president can actually become president again. I called him up this afternoon, had a conversation with him, and we had a, a short uh, sort of banter, friendly argument on the phone. I'd invited him to join me in the studio so that we can explore the argument um, for viewers to take their positions and to understand it better. But I think he's had some difficulties. He's not able to arrive in the studio. His phone is off, and we are not able to reach him. Uh, so I'll, I'll say to you viewers anyway what I told him. Here is Article 66. It's going to come up on your screen now and then we can look at it because um, some information that gets out of the media re relating to um, things like this should really be clarified, very, very importantly clarified. Um, so you can see in the Article 66 one says that a person elected as president shall, subject to Clause 3 of this article, hold office for a term of four years beginning from the day on which he is sworn in as president. That's one. Two, a person shall not be elected to hold office as president of Ghana for more than two terms. Th that's the critical one. Two says, a person shall not be elected to hold office as president of Ghana for more than two terms. Now, there are two ways in which a person can hold office for two terms, either consecutively or separately. Consecutively, as in, this, as in Flight Lieutenant Rollins and Mr. Kufour, where one term follows the other, 
um, so that he is re-elected for a second term, as, as he do in America all over the world. So that's one way in which you can have two terms consecutively. The other way in which you can have two terms is separately. You were president from 1990 to 1994. You lost the election. You went away, came back in 2000, and became president from 2000 to 2004. In either case, whether consecutively or separately, you have become president for two terms, and therefore you are debarred under Article 66.2 where it says that a person shall not be elected to hold office as president for more than two terms. That's quite straightforward. Let's look at three. It says, the office of president shall become vacant. Now, it's, it's telling us when the office of president becomes vacant. A, on the expiration of the period specified in clause one of this article, or B, if the incumbent dies or resigns from office or ceases to hold office under Article 69 of this constitution. Now, 69 is um, impeachment, etc., etc. So, on the expiration of the period of presidency, um, so that on the 8th January 2021, President Akufado's mandate, um, which started in uh, 2016 or 2017 January, would have expired and he would cease to be president. The other way is when the incumbent dies, in the case of Professor Mills, which we all witnessed sadly on the um, 24th of July 2012, Professor Mills died and therefore the position became vacant and President Mahama ascended the, the position. Okay, so. Let's come back to two. Dr. Osai's erroneous understanding, and I, I, I make the point quite strongly, that it's an erroneous understanding. Dr. Osai's erroneous understanding of two, that a person shall not be elected to hold office as president for more than two terms, is that once you have held uh, two terms, you cannot do a third term. That's how he understands it. That the two terms, for somebody who has done two terms and cannot continue to do a third term, that cannot be the interpretation, the right interpretation to 66.2. It cannot even be fathomed in that regard. It makes a whole nonsense of the whole constitutional democratic exercise that a person is president for two terms and he cannot do a third term. So he can come in and do another two terms. That's totally absurd. That's not correct. It cannot be correct under any circumstance. And I made the point to him quite forcefully this afternoon on the phone that a person shall not be elected to hold office as president for more than two terms. It debars two groups of people. One president who has held two terms consecutively and another president who has held two terms separately. Both categories of president are debarred by Article 66.2. And the view of Dr. Asai cannot be correct and um, it's absolutely <laughs> improper even for us to think that way. So people ask the questions about President Mahama. President Mahama has done one term and he's therefore eligible to do another term. Obviously, if President Mahama gets another term, it would have been two separate terms, and he would have served the two terms separately, not consecutively. Uh, President Kufo served two terms consecutively, Mr. Rollins two terms consecutively, and Mr. Kufado is in his first term. President Mahama has served one term, and thus he's eligible to contest another term. After that second term, he will be out on 66-2. And this is a small matter of clarification that we wanted to bring, to, especially to our young viewers and students of, of Constitution, uh, so that we don't get worried uh, about the uh, what the stuff that Dr. Osai has been putting out. Okay, thanks for listening to that one. We are now going to our guest, Mr. Kujoyanka, who is already in the studio. Uh, he'll be joining us in the studio to talk about his book. And we do have uh, a few questions for him about the book. He'll first tell us about the events he's putting up, and then we can deal with the book uh, shortly. So let's take a break again uh, with our choir, and then we'll take a commercial break. We'll be right back. This is Good Evening Ghana, and it's live. Uh -huh. Tell Joe that I'm sending him something.
recover yourself before any breakdown. Never allow yourself to be in a distressed situation as a driver or motorist on the road. At Road Safety Management Services Limited, we want to take away your stress levels by towing your vehicle to safety as swiftly as possible. With our annual towing subscription service, you can subscribe to any vehicle of your choice, as many as you want, and enjoy a hassle-free resolution to all your breakdown and accident needs. We guarantee you a swift and smooth towing recovery service experience at any location in Ghana. From as low as 40 cities, we guarantee you a choice of towing service solution, a 24-hour service, two times a year, a toll-free customer call center for swift service response and service availability nationwide. Call us now on toll-free 0800-772-772 or visit roadsafetyservices.org to sign up. The fans have voted for the BBC African Footballer of the Year 2018. Will it be towering defender Mehdi Benatia, defensive dynamo Khalidou Koulibaly, supersonic Sadio Mane, midfield maestro Thomas Partey, or star striker Mohamed Salah? Find out who will lift the trophy this year when Focus on Africa reveals the winner of the BBC African Footballer of the Year 2018. Live on Metro TV. Welcome back. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, this is Good Evening Ghana and uh, it's still live. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Um, how are you? I'm fine. And you? Okay. Uh, how is the NDC? Well, I'm not a spokesperson for the NDC, so I don't want to talk about the NDC. Yeah, I vote NDC, but I'm not a spokesperson for the party. Mm. Yeah. So, you don't want to tell us what's happening in the NDC? No, I have no idea. But you will vote NDC come the next election? Oh, that's my, that's my privilege. Okay, um, let's talk about the book. I'm sure maybe when the text messages come, people will ask you more direct questions. Mm -hmm. The Trial of J.J. Rollins was a, a popular book that people of my generation uh, grew up to just read because we were not old enough to assimilate some of those things. So we're uh, very grateful to you, Mr. Kujianka, for putting the document together. How difficult was it to write the book then? Yeah. Um, in context, the book was written within the period, say, 1980 to 85, but eventually got out of the press, Ghana Publishing House in 1986. Um, okay. I was, in 79, I had just come out of the Graduate School of Communications. I, I was a journalist, I was hosting programs on radio and television at GBC. I was writing articles, I was also working for Gihok at the time, and saw what was happening, um, observed what was happening, more or less as a journalist, and therefore took interest in documenting what was going on. So after the dust had settled, I decided to put it all together and produce the trial of J.J. Rollins in 1986. And uh, I must say that it was an instant hit. Ghana Publishing uh, confessed that it was the biggest seller they had ever gotten, you know, in a long while. I don't think they've done. They had done that before because 
5,000 copies were sold within a year. Mm -hmm. And um, what you're holding is the U.S. edition, which was done in the U.S. Uh, in the early 90s. And that did 2,000 copies and also got uh, finished. Ghana Publishing attempted to do another one, uh, only a few copies. And after that, um, since 1992, there has not been any more. And the demand has been there. Uh, people have requested me and other people, and I decided that, well, I was busy doing something else. So at some point, after I'd finished my own uh, memoirs, I would, I would uh, go back to it, edit a few things. The original um, Professor Botry, who wrote the foreword, passed, so I redid it with a new uh, writer. And um, putting a few changes here and there. So it's a second edition in the sense that it is not a 1986 edition. OK, but you know, just to get back to the, uh, the context of today's politics and the politics that you participated in towards the end of the Rawlings regime, your relationship with Fly Lips and Rawlings was not the best by the time you exited, all of you exited government. Uh, so, I mean, some people actually felt that Mr. Rawlings didn't treat you well, and they said for the man who made him popular to the intellectuals of the society, the, the, the narrative is that Mr. Rawlings was not particularly popular to many intellectuals, but it was your book that sort of assessed and analyzed in depth um, what occurred throughout the May, June 4th of 1979 period. That got some intellectuals beginning to sort of understand the the position that Rawlings came from and the philosophy that sort of underpinned all the actions that he took, including the fact that people got to know from your book for the first time that he wasn't entirely responsible for the executions and that at some point things were really out of his own control. Because I think those days media was not as it is today. So your book made them know that. People felt that JJ had not treated this person uh, who was his amplifier very well. And after that, you, you did work for the Asante Man and Otufo and all of that. Why are you coming back to write about the man who, it is said, did not treat you well in government? <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting an analysis. Um, first of all, fact is fact. Um, the fact of 1979 remains a fact in our history. It has... <clears throat> it cannot be erased. And um, people have to live with facts. I, I will not say that Rawlings is my friend. I mean, as you rightly said, my book, uh, Motherland, told about the relationships between us. But that was the official position. And I know in politics, a lot of things happen. I think I've grown old enough to know that a lot of uh, pressures take place in, in political environments uh, from various corners. I'm not, uh, you know, did, I'm not saying that who, uh, somebody else was responsible for this or that, but I believe as a writer and also as a journalist that facts should remain facts. Now, over a period, you realize that sometimes we forget ourselves and um, once in a while, I believe that we should be reminded of where we have come from. Uh, this is my political philosophy. It's not a general thing. And I responded to public demand for a re-edit of the book or a reproduction of the book and decided to bring it out. But I wanted to do it at my own time and at my own pace. This could have come about 10 years ago, but I decided that let me finish working on my own memoirs. And after that, I'll go back to it and represent it. The, the message may be as relevant today as uh, it was in 1979. You so. paint Mr. Rollins as a hero of, of, in your book, he comes out across as the hero of the entire event. We have now done uh, more than 35 years after that and Ghana has seen many more transitions through the period. The generals who were executed 
were had their bodies removed and reburied, as the government of Mr. Kufo put it, to be given a dignified burial in 2001. The effects of the corruption that JJ fought in 1979, for which reason all the things occurred, uh, may have quadrupled in terms of the way the society sees it. The social fiber that he fought for has been completely deconstructed within the context even of his own administration. And he has had occasion to criticize uh, Don Mohammed's administration, Professor Mills's administration of corruption. So in your second edition, given the time and what posterity has seen, do you still paint JJ as the hero of that event? No, it's not a question of painting JJ as a hero of the event. It's, it is, it is um, a fact of history that something happened. Mm -hmm. It is not a repainting. I mean, in 1979, something happened. There was a mini meeting in the Ghana Armed Forces. And uh, out of the mutiny, seven people were arrested. Mm -hmm. They were put before a court martial, uh, you know, and they were also being prepared for, for defense on the 4th of June. And junior officers within the military organized themselves to release him from custody, take him to broadcasting house to announce June 4th. It's a fact of history. So it is not a question of painting him uh, as a hero. And again, when he uh, went to the trial, it was an open trial, he said, leave my men alone. I'm responsible for everything. That sparked a lot of uh, agitation amongst uh, the people, among the armed forces. And the fact remains that when that happened, students of the University of Ghana closed down the university themselves, poured into the streets, workers poured into the streets, and, and supported the event. And uh, some called for let the blood flow. They are all historical facts. So there's nothing, uh, you know, painting him as a hero. It was something that happened within our history. And I think that no matter how, how, how people see it, um, it's, the fact remains that this event occurred at some point in our history. Naturally, mm. people ha see things differently. I mean, people, I, 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 have no, I have no objection to people uh, analyzing in any way they want. But I want to say that the fact remains that this happened in our history and nobody can wipe it away. Just like other events. So are you going to repeat that, these facts? Because these facts are in volume one and these facts are, have become notorious facts of our political history. So what really are you doing in volume two? No, what, what is, it's like reprinting uh, you know, what happened. Mm -hmm. what, what happened in 1986 in the book that happened. Nothing has changed. I mean, people's analysis may probably uh, have been different. But in terms of the fact that they happened, they happened. During the period, there were elections. Mm -hmm. It's all there in the book. Um, all the, the various opinions and very man manifestos of political parties were all there. So it's even good for history, history students to go back to see what exactly happened in 19. 86, in case people have forgotten. So I'm just well, making a contribution. One. The one. same, it's the so same what's thing. in volume two? It's, it's a reproduction, actually. So do you it, add some it, analysis to it? No, it's the same thing. It's a, it's a reprint. Okay. Uh, so let me say that it's a reprint of the 1986 edition. OK, but it looks like it's bigger than what I'm holding, isn't it? Oh, it's yes, what happened is that, yeah, this is, the, this is what is coming out. OK, this is how it looks like. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry. OK. This is how it looks like. It, was, it, will, it will be on the screen in a minute. They're just fixing the camera. Okay. So yeah. this, this is how it looks like. This is the American version of the old one, the green one mm -hmm. on the right. And this is the way the new one would look like. Uh, the trial of J.J. Rollins with Mr. Rollins' photograph. So why, is it, why does it appear bigger? Right. It appears bigger because the, the prints mm -hmm. in the 1986 and 19 edition were so small. So it was even difficult to read. Mm -hmm. um, so I decided at this time we should bring out the prints bigger to make it easy reading, make for easy reading. And that's why it's, um, it's bigger in the more number of pages. But it's why don't you, uh, given your experience and your experience in government, why don't you add some, why didn't you add some analysis 
within the context of all what has happened? No, that will be subject of another book. That will be content of another book. Mm. Yeah, because... So you are preparing another book? I'm doing another book. Okay, what's it going to be called? Oh, no, I, I will <laughs> okay, reveal you can't it say for... No. <laughs> I, I get it. But, okay, so if we may get into your mind on this another book, uh, you just want us to know that this is what happened, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. in, in uh, so many years ago that people may have forgotten and mm -hmm. all of that, but this mm -hmm. is what happened. Mm -hmm. What should we do with that? Well, you go to Paris and people watch, still watch films of the French Revolution. Mm -hmm. People still watch films of the American Revolution. Mm -hmm. People still watch films of the Russian Revolution. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's documentation. And the lack of it has also created um, some deficiency in our own knowledge about ourselves. And I, I believe that all points in history should be well recorded uh, for, for, for the youth. Now, if you look at today, I wonder how many, uh, what percentage of our population is under 40. But if, the, as our you know, demographics say, they, they constitute about 40, 50% of the population, you realize they do not know our history. Mm -hmm. They do not even know 79, you know. So I think that uh, intellectuals should continue to make contributions towards understanding of where we have come from. This is, you know, a very modest contribution. You are right about that because uh, as I looked at the book, uh, I found out things that I had never seen uh, when I first saw it as a secondary school student. And it's on page 34 here. Um, it says that, an elite group, the Society for National Welfare, reacted even more sharply to the international consent. There had been international consent apparently about the coup d'etat. And they issued a press release which said as follows, the Society for National Welfare wishes to express concerns about some aspects of the international reactions to current events in Ghana, in particular, the use of the threat to use economic and other sanctions to influence internal politics and decisions. It goes on that while we do not deny any nation, individual, organization, the freedom to make observations on and react to events in other countries, we note with very grave concern the extremely hostile reactions to recent events in Ghana from our traditional friends in Africa, in the Commonwealth and in some other parts of the world. Some of these reactions seem to be aimed at deflecting the Armed Forces Revolutionary Council AFRC from its stated objectives, namely that of cleaning up the country of those vices which have resulted in the almost impossible living conditions to which the majority of Ghanaians have been subjected within the last few years. What is even more disappointing, the statement said, in these reactions is the almost total lack of appreciation of the circumstances that led to the action of June 4th. And yet, most of these countries have been aware of the debt to which our country has sunk as a result of Repacity, corruption, extreme insensitivity of those who are taking up arms ostensibly to redeem Ghana from the intolerable conditions under which they were living. Ghana became the laughing stock of the world and we were openly ridiculed in a television quiz program of a sister African country. As a result of these intolerable conditions, large numbers of our professionals, graduate teachers, mechanics and other able-bodied young people out of sheer frustration left to seek fortunes in neighboring countries. Deprivation became almost total, etc., etc. Now, this is signed by a society called um, the uh, Society for National Welfare. Were they existing? Yes. And Nana Rekwampem uh, signed the document as president, and ESA do signed as vice president. Nana Rekwampem, uh, the Oye man, was he not an appointee of the Champon administration? No. Okay. Much so, earlier. Much earlier he was with the, with the NRC. Another regime. Mm -hmm. Okay. So they said, who were they? Who were these? Well, I, I chanced upon the statement that they issued. Mm -hmm. and uh, so, so you call them an elite group. Why, why do you? Oh, because definitely they were elite. They were, they were not the, I think, yes, Edu was a judicial secretary. Mm -hmm. Definitely they were not a, a, a trade union group. They, they were an elite group of people who, who were also analyzing the situation uh, in the country. So, mm. uh, and that was their statement. I want to show uh, viewers the trailer to what you'll be doing on the 31st. And I'll come back and ask you whether, in, in your own view, as, as a writer and a journalist, whether you think that the events of June 4th um, 
I think it's clear that everyone should know about it, but is it regrettable? Is it, you know, whether... Oh, whether naturally. I mean... In, I mean, including the uprising itself. Yes. Uh, you know, what is regrettable? I, I don't know. I think you are putting opinion on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see, uh, nobody is cheering what happened. Nobody yeah. is, is saying that everything that happened was excellent and great. I mean, just like going back to Ghana before independence, you know, there were, they, they have been, you know, between the CPP, the NLM, and all kinds of things that happened to in this country, action through press period and all that, many, many, many Ghanaians lost their lives. Listen, we had 1966 coup d'etat, definitely some people lost their lives. So, those regrettable moments, nobody ever wishes that somebody would lose his life. But sometimes we also lose sight of circumstances that lead to some of these things. And that statement, whether it came from an elite group or a student group or um, a Makola women's group, was representing the mood of the time. And I think that it's important we, we go back to our history, even since independence, to really analyze what, what we have been able to do in comparison with other countries on the continent. Because if you really look at the trend of politics in Africa, coup d'etat was not a monopoly of Ghana. I mean, across, across, across the continent, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And a whole lot of things happened after independence that one has to take into consideration in analyzing any situation. Whatever has happened today is not coming out of the, of, of, of the moon. Mm. It's, it's uh, a consequence of some of the things that have happened in the past. So in analyzing any student of political history should look not only at today, but the circumstances. Well, okay, but what has, this analysis becomes imperative because of the personality of JJ mm -hmm. and because he carried on throughout the period up until 19, the year 2000. Right. So, and, and fell out incidentally with some mm -hmm. of the people who had the June 4th with him, like Bwachi Jan mm -hmm. and Tasiri and mm -hmm. all of these people who have become enemies of him uh, at some point and, and even apparently tried to overthrow him when he was doing the PNDC. So, some people who don't like Rawlins look at him as... Uh, one who took advantage of the situation, that his desire was never about cleaning up anything, but his desire was to perpetrate himself in power. And he revealed that in coming back to overthrow the constitutional government that had been established out of his house cleaning, which was, as they say, the main objective of the AFRC, to establish a constitutional regime so that Ghana can move forward. It was the same Rawlings who came back and overthrew that constitutional regime and led the country for that long, so that if at the end of his tenure, if you look back, those who don't like JJ say that it was all about himself. Well, I don't deny anybody his or her opinion. I think that people have all kinds of opinion or about anybody, and so do I. Um, what is stated here is, as I, and I, I must repeat, is just what happened in 1979. And it ends... Uh, the book mm -hmm. ends uh, on, uh, at the, on the eve of 31st of December. But even more important, the, the play cannot take that long. So the play only ends on the morning of June 4th, and that's over. Oh, on the morning of June 4th, they're released yeah. from prison. Yes. Okay. That's, that's I'll come to the trailer of the play, but if you were talking about the political history of Ghana and there may be regrettable incidents and all of that, if we have to draw a line and put a positive incidents in one corner and regrettable incidents in another corner, even if we start from the bond of 1844 <laughs> and then we come to the Aborigines in 1897, that Aborigines certainly will be an event that everyone could be proud of up until today. We move down to, say, the Clifford Constitution of 1916, and then, in particular, the Gadgetsburg Constitution of 1925 that created at Motor School, Kolebu, and all of that, we will still be proud of it. We come down to the Coco situation in uh, 1938 and the establishment of the UGCC, the establishment of the University of Ghana up until the violence between the NLM and CPP, and then the events of independence. Independence is certainly one that people will be proud of. The events of 1966 was bloody, and so people might not be proud of it, but 1969 constitutions should get almost 100 percent 
the removal of the of those people uh, should not be excited exciting june 4 1979 the constitution of the third republic the constitution of the fourth republic and up to where we are if we are drawing a line and say that let's have the regrettable ones on the left and the others on the right and cancel out the regrettable ones and so that we can see never again where do you think June 4th will stand? I, 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 I would not write my history like that. You know, the, 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 what you call regrettable and non-regrettable and all that, they are all part of our history. Mm -hmm. See, it's, 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 it doesn't, it's not even realistic to take some aspects of our history out and say this is the neatest part of our history and let's follow it. No, it doesn't happen. There's no country with a history like that. Well, but the Second World War is regretted by the whole world. They say never again. Oh, my goodness. I mean, it's out of the Second World War that the Cold War started mm -hmm. after that. So no, no, people can offer their opinions. These are all um, intellectual opinions. Let, let them have their opinions. But the point is that Second World War, because of the destruction, and this is an international thing. But again, you won't say that when you get a, a film on the Second World War, people are still watching various yeah. aspects of the film. Yeah. But that doesn't mean that you are worshipping the, 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 the rebellion or the negative parts of the war. I get it. Let's watch so it. So when we you watch this, I mean? should we watch it and say never again? Or should we watch it and say we'll take this? Or should we, there, there would be some never again and there would be some good aspects? Yeah, Paul, th these are... <laughs> These are pointed questions, but the point I'm making is that we should not forget our history, mm -hmm. right? There were circumstances that led to the, the, the rebellion, 15th of May, and of course, June 4th. Now, I'm not, I'm not a prophet to say never again will it happen, but we must learn from our history, if you ask me. Certain conditions existed. Why did certain, con certain conditions existed before Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown? Mm -hmm. Are we going to say never again? It's human beings. We, if we learn from our history, it will not happen again. But look, from there, people, a whole lot of things have happened in our history. Within the SMC, look at what happened. We had SMC1, SMC2, as if we had learned our lessons. No, we hadn't that a different uh, form of rebellion came in. And I'm saying that we are looking only at the political. Lo let's look at the socioeconomic conditions that existed, the kind of values that we derive from some of the things that happened. Now, here we are. We are in a country where we are even divided on the achievement of Kwame Nkrumah, right? Mm -hmm. And we look at only one, oh, one party dictatorship. Yes. And the PDA. And the PDA. Mm -hmm. That's fine. But again, another analysis puts it in a context. And after, after independence, if you really look at world history and the 40 years of the Cold War, almost all countries in Africa that came out of independence when the socialist path. The reason, they were supported in their struggle for independence by the East, the Soviet bloc, and later China. So it is not accidental that Ghana, Zimbabwe, Tanzania, even to some extent Nigeria, had leaders who had socialist slants because it was the socialist camp that supported agitation for independence. The, 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 the but socialism does not warrant the abuse of rights. Socialism no, 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 no. It's a political philosophy. That's I'm not, I'm not, I'm not uh, you know, um, saying that everything was good. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm talking about the circumstances under which most of the government went the way they went. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it happened not only in, in Ghana. And if you want to look at all the, the historical signposts in all those countries that gained independence, you find that there were some elements of dictatorship. And I'm not saying that it was a good thing, but I'm saying it happened, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm just saying that we should understand the circumstances under which certain things happen. 
when Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown, whoever thought, you know, we, we would go back into military regime. Nobody dreamt, but circumstances forced another coup d'etat in 1972, and then on and on and on to 79, and there were other attempts and so on and so forth. So, but I'm saying those are the political ones. Mm. And as a nation, we should also look at the socioeconomic, what was going on on the ground. Why do we still talk about corruption? Why do we still talk about the abuse of power? Why do we still talk about nepotism? Why do we still talk about accountability, probity, and all that? It means the efforts to end them in June 4 failed. Not only in June 4, they started from our independence. Mm. It's not a question of failing. No. How can this is a nation? You mm -hmm. see, we, we, I don't think that we should isolate one event and say the efforts failed. If you look at the, 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 the indi after independence, what did the CPP want to do? But after independence, did we have several commissions of inquiry into corruption and other practices? Yeah. It still remained there. It's not, it, it does not mean that the independence efforts failed. No, it didn't. So, so is that the history that we have to look at? Okay. It looks like you're putting it together uh, to attract the young people in, the, in a way uh, that you add the drama. I want to talk about that now, but let's see the trailer uh, to the event on 31st December uh, 2018 at the National Theatre. Uh, here's a trailer and then uh, Mr. Yanka will tell us the concept behind this one. A true story that changed the course of Ghana's history, creatively told with music and drama. The trial of J.J. Rawlings. Hello. You better shut up when I'm talking, okay? And the line is not straight. Move! Monday, 31st December, come experience a truly significant moment in Ghana's social political history, captured in a rich musical drama at the National Theatre, 3 p.m. prompt, and witness the official launch of the book, The Trial of J.J. Rawlings, second edition by the renowned Kojo Yanka. Admission plus the book is 100 Ghana cities. Don't miss a thrilling adventure into Ghana's modern political Political History, Monday, 31st December 2018 at 3 p.m. at the National Theatre. Also showing from 3rd to 5th January 2019 at 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. daily. The Trial of J.J. Rawlings. But, so tell us, is, is drama somebody going to act as J.J.? Somebody going to act as uh, Nana Kunedu and Bwachijan and Tasiri. How is, it, is it a drama group? Yeah, there's, a, there's a, a team from the National Theatre and School of Performing Arts mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who are acting out uh, the, the, um, the play based on the story from Ghana's uh, conditions uh, in 79 up to the 15th of May, the trial itself what happened at the trial, and then uh, what emerged finally as, uh, as June 4th. That's it. So you're going to have people on stage in military uniforms holding oh, guns yes. and, and shooting and all that? Not shooting. I mean, the effect of it. You see, this, is, it? this is musical. No, you're not. You, you, ah, it's yeah, musical. It's also musical. There is there's a lot of music behind it. So it's, it makes it... Um, very interesting, mm -hmm. very lively, but at the same time telling a message. The message of May 15th, the message of June 4th. Now, whether that message has impacted or not, it's another matter. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that that is what happened during that time. And uh, people have, you know, every chance to see whether we have come far as a nation or whether we are repeating the kind of things that attempts were made to stop in the past. We are definitely repeating some of those, <laughs> those well, things, but we uh, do not uh, endorse no. the manner in which uh, the June 4th people did it. And I'm sure the 1992 constitution is very clear on, on things like that. So, uh, but there's, this is going to be a beautiful, how do people get there? How do they get there? So 100 cities plus the book. So you pay 100 yeah. cities, you see it, and you get the book. You get the book. Excellent. So uh, the idea is to, again, you know, we are not a reading Mm. nation but I think it's important that we read so many things have been taken for granted because we are not reading enough and so a few people read and then you know spew what about their opinions and then they become the order of the day I mm. think this nation I know the Ghana Association of Writers and others have been 
trying, a lot of NGOs are trying hard to get us to read, particularly in uh, this technologically um, advancing age and computer world. Um, yeah. So this will be there. So your, your gate fee entitles you to a copy of the book. Mm -hmm. and so after you watch the drama, you should read it. Oh, you shouldn't you make it part of our curricula uh, in terms of our, uh, history didn't used to be I think they took it off but now they brought it back as a, as an important it's subject shame, yeah yeah it was it was a, you, you write somewhere in the book that's what I'm looking for that it would have been difficult to tell what would have happened uh, if JJ had not become would you explore that in your next uh, no I think uh, you're picking from mm -hmm. a review a forward to the to this current ah, one where yeah. some yes Yes, so yes, yes. That's why I picked it from. Yes, saying yes, that, yes, 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 yes. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. That if, if all of this hadn't happened, how would Ghana have been? Because if these things hadn't happened, the Third Republican uh, Constitution would still have occurred. I, I, I wouldn't know. But see, if you look at... No, the timetable was already set. So The timetable was set for the elections. Yes, campaign had started. Campaign had started. Yes, so the election would have happened. The, elec the election happened. It did. It would have happened with or without JJ, I mean. Yes. JJ made it a bit more difficult, but the election did happen. <laughs> yes, but again, it also tells me and maybe people with that kind of frame of mind that it is not just elections that solves people's problems. Mm -hmm. See, there are, there are very basic socioeconomic conditions on the ground. Yeah. Elections just cover, cover up. You know, but otherwise... Elections cover up? Oh, they do. Elections are just going to elect a group of people to hope that they will solve those problems. But the problems, why, we, why, why do we still hold elections? Why do we say that, oh, we need another group of people all the time to hoping, hoping, hoping that situations will change? Well, we'll get change. to the point one day where we have to change the constitution. Constitution, yes. I mean, again, the constitution after working with it over a period will need some reforms. And I, I would even make some contributions coming out of my own experience. But I'm saying that the Constitution, you know, people for the Constitution, at the writing of the Constitution, the Ghana Bar Association, for example, decided not to take part in the Constitution. So the Constitution writing itself lost some elements. It did, yeah. Yeah. And so when people criticize it, I'm saying, well, we had the opportunity. Some people stayed out of it, and now this is where we are. If after some time we all decide that let's, let's review, and I know that attempts were made to take suggestions to, for reforming the Constitution, I don't know where we are with it, but every constitution, you know, being dynamic. So you are saying that it's organic and it grows and uh, it doesn't, it's not stagnant. Absolutely. So we, we keep growing. Absolutely. Okay, but we'll still be hoping and waiting for you to be able to pass some minimal judgment on the things that uh, occurred in your book, in your second book, hopefully when it comes. No, I don't think that... You don't judge, want to pass any judgment. I don't think that judgment is the, is the word. You see... Uh, for all you know, and I think you agreed with me a few minutes ago, that some of the th s s uh, things that were in existence at the time also continue today. Yes. You see, so we should ask ourselves, why, why are we still in those situations? But let me also say one thing. You see, in 79, 78, 79, was a difficult period not only for Ghana but for Africa. If you look at the period where UNICEF, for example, uh, says that about one third of the graduates of Africa left the continent, those were very harsh times in the, in the life of the continent, and including Ghana. So and the economies of the world, GDP you know, reduced to about 2.5, the whole of, uh, of the world. And so there were difficulties that were also affecting African countries, except perhaps. So we, we had some very, very serious challenges. And when challenges come, what do you do? You, everybody looks up to leadership. But if you find that leadership is, en is just enjoying and forgetting about the ordinary people, it doesn't matter whether you have a constitution or not. You see, it's th this is another, another debate, but I'm saying, Let's, let's take 
with us some values that will help us to reduce the kind of tensions that arise when systems uh, begin to change, you know, or, or, uh, you know, in the country and, and all. You, you sound like you are worried, Mr. Yanka, that some of these conditions yeah. that gave rise to June 4th seem to be simmering. And um, you, you are kind of worried that you are sort of reminding us that this had happened before. So if we are not careful, oh, we might get there again. Yep. No, no, privately, I worry that we have not learned our lessons. Mm. In the coups or rebellions or dissatisfaction does not only have to express itself with guns. Mm -hmm. You understand? People vote with their feet in, in terms of they are against what is going on. And sometimes, if, if you are very observant, if you crowd 200 people in this room, definitely there, there will be more tension than if you have six people. You because understand? we'll be juggling for space. There you go. Now, I do not want to stretch it, but if you look at what is happening in some of our universities, you and I were probably in halls that had, in secondary school, you had about 600 people. Mm -hmm. If you put 1,500 people in the same room, what will they feel? Pressure and tension. Thank you. So th these are social tensions. Are you tensions. blaming leadership? No, I... I, I <laughs> you don't want to blame anyone. Maybe we, we, can, we can have another debate on that. On that. But I'm okay. making general statements to see that I get concerned when things that happened and gave rise to certain things are, 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 are repeating themselves. Okay. And we, we have to take you very serious because you have sat at the highest table of political leadership for a very long time. And you have also been acquainted sufficiently with traditional leadership and you've been a member of parliament. So if somebody like you is worried, uh, then the rest of us must be afraid. Oh, afraid is not the word. Uh, I think we should teach ourselves lessons. And we, we should be, what we have done in this country which is wrong is to compartmentalize every problem. It's either this party or that party. I don't think it helps us. Let's see, let's see issues as national issues. Fine, you have one, uh, party in power. Let's hope that they can listen and resolve those problems. You think that politicians going around in this country don't, don't know what is going on in their villages? They know. I don't you have think multi-party democracy is not the best? It's um, Africa. We, we, need to, we, we need to debate yeah. that again. Yeah. Well, uh, you, you are, in, again, in a very good position because you have been with a of the military rule and that change to constitutional rule. So you have seen the speed with which decisions are taken, the ability to draw skills of other people and all of that, which you get in the earlier one, which you might not get in multi-party uh, democracy. Mm -hmm. And some people have started writing about the African context and how we need to have a look at the, the skill set and see what kind of system can bring a lot more skill set onto the table than the partisan one. You've also been a member of parliament a partisan member of parliament. Mm -hmm. So your view is that multi-party should be reviewed? I think at some point we should have a conversation with ourselves. Whether what we borrowed from the West and imposed on our system is the, is the right way to go. You know, I, I, I like comparative analysis. And I, I look at the Asian countries. 30 years ago, we're all laughing at China. We're laughing at India. We're laughing at... Countries that use their own culture as their base. I mean, I don't think... Malaysia. 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 And you know, when people say Ghana and Malaysia, sometimes we, we forget, we, we, we forget the, the, the different roles, uh, different routes that we took. Yes, we got independence at the same time, but they systematically, under a leader, with the guidance, and with, uh, yes, the Socialist Party was there, but people kept changing, even within the party, because people at the base wanted some of their MPs changed, some of their ministers changed, but that guidance was there and systematically helped them to grow the economy. And there were a lot of Chinese who had come out of mainland China who were rich, 
who also settled in Malaysia. I don't know how many people have been to Malaysia. There's a large population of rich Chinese who, who also helped with, with, with capital, helped the economy to grow, plantations from here to Cape Coast, and helped the economy to be the first world of the third world as we are talking today. They did not overthrow their leader. Yes, they, they protested. There were a lot of demonstrations in Malaysia, particularly when the government wanted to change, uh, to turn the state farms into cooperatives. And then they saw that mm, the government wants to do something, you know, because they want to nationalize uh, state farms and keep them. But at the same time, they wanted to, uh, you know, move away from total state control, gave them to cooperatives, and later into private hands. So they had their own system of easing out. So you think that in selecting a government for mm -hmm. our people, we should have been more careful about the context of our history, our culture, the way Clearly. in which we organize our society, Clearly. and select a system that fits that, Clearly. rather than what appears Clearly. to be an American system Clearly. Uh, that lacks accountability and, Clearly. and all of that. Clearly, that's my concern. Mm, I see. That's interesting. Let's have another look at the, the trailer. If you're just joining us, uh, we have had a, a very sensitive but useful conversation with uh, Mr. Kujoyanka, who, has, uh, who wrote that famous book, The Trials of J.J. Rawlins, and uh, is, is doing a second edition, republishing it, but is going to stage it in a musical drama on the 31st of December um, at the National Theatre in Accra, and subsequently on other days, in Accra only, or is it going to Kumasi as well? Yeah, after, after Accra, we are moving to the universities. Uh, Kumasi, KNUST, UDS in Tamale. Mm. It will come down to Takradi Polytechnic, Cape Coast University, and whole Polytechnic, all the regional capitals. Okay, let's have a look at the trailer. We'll be back soon. A true story that changed the course of Ghana's history, creatively told with music and drama. The trial of J.J. Rawlings. Hello. You better shut up when I'm talking, okay? And the line is not straight. Move. Monday, 31st December. Come experience a truly significant moment in Ghana's social political history. Captured in a rich musical drama at the National Theatre. 3 p.m. prompt and witness the official launch of the book, The Trial of J.J. Rawlings, second edition by the renowned Kojo Yanka. Admission plus the book is 100 Ghana cities. Don't miss a thrilling adventure into Ghana's modern political history Monday 31st December 2018 at 3 p.m. at the National Theatre also showing from 3rd to 5th January 2019 at 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. daily the trial of JJ Rolex uh, hi I was reading a text from my phone forgive me okay so uh, the 19 minutes by the top of the uh, 10 o'clock we're having a nice conversation with mr. Yanka uh, but we cannot end this conversation, uh, Mr. Yanka, without asking you about your recent uh, public appearance on social media, where you had uh, a bit of advice for President Mahama. You think he shouldn't have con he shouldn't consider to contest the NDC flag bearership right now. He has his both legs in there, but you are advising him against it. But why? Well, that was a personal opinion, and uh, I, I probably got the sense that it was belated. And so I leave it as an opinion, you know, and I do not want to take it any further. But you were attacked for coming public with it without talking to him, somebody that you know quite well, uh, going to him and saying that, Brother John, I, I think you shouldn't contest, but rather you put it out publicly and uh, his luckies really came after you. Well, I wasn't really worried that people came after me. It's, it, I expected it. It's, it's, you know, it's part of um, measuring you know, people's uh, political temperature. But I thought it was time for me to do it. And I did it at the right time that I did. I, and I, I'm, I'm a person that believes that people have their own opinions and if there was an overriding uh, reason for him to go on. Why not? I mean, I'm sure that I probably am not the only person who was trying to give that piece of advice, but 
at the end of the day, it's the person himself decides. And he must have had a reason for still sticking ahead. But you still think that he shouldn't have contested? I mean, at this moment, I, my opinion doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, but we want to know it, whether you still think that he shouldn't have contested. And, that, and is it because he had been president before? Because you didn't say Joshua Labi shouldn't contest, you didn't say other people? No, 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 no. I, I think the, the Post said exactly, you know, everything that I wanted to say, and I wanted to stop at that. And I, that's, that's, that was my opinion at that very time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. What is your inclination of the future of politics in Ghana? Apart from the fact that we may be running a tightrope in terms of not being able to deliver the social services that democracy promises, uh, which many people are worried about. But what's, what's your, of the immediate future of politics, 2020 election and all that? My, my, my concern is that we are reducing every problem to partisan politics. We look at education, we look at health, we look at social systems, we look at agriculture. And if you are making an objective opinion, you probably have to worry whether this is going to sound right in the ears of those in power or you know, out of power. And I think it's a very dangerous thing. It's, 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 giving, it's giving a lot of people the opportunity to just stay aloof you know, because um, a party has promised. It, must, it is delivering because it was an electoral promise. Whether there are potholes or not, it's an electoral promise. Let's go through them. And that doesn't seem to be right. You are referring to the free SHS, for instance? Well, there are many, there are many, many issues, you know, going on. I, 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 I look back as an educationist myself, I, I look at the quality of education. We have already been warned about the poor quality of education of Ghanaians over the period. It's, there are certain pointers that show us that, yes, we have, we have good people in this country, and I all want, always want to believe that any, any government genuinely has the interest of the people at heart. I want to believe that. And when you have certain aspirations and you come face to face with certain realities, I do not think that it hurts to tell the people of Ghana, well, this is what we intended. But uh, as a result of this and that, we would want to review what we originally thought, thought we could do. See, this country has come very far. And looking back, from the 70s, one should not also run away from what is going on around us, not only in Africa, but worldwide. And you find that after two years in power, for example, it is now that President Trump is designing a policy for Africa. We do not matter. Africa does not matter. And we are just, we think we are okay in our little country cocooned here and playing the little politics. But we are all linked up. Once you, you, are, you, are, you have a dollarized economy, you must know that everything that happens outside also affects you. So we, we, I thought, for example, that we would be closer as African countries together by this time. Um, but we are drifting apart. And I find that very unfortunate. You know, it makes all the efforts at uniting the efforts of the continent, you know, w w wasted. And I, I get worried because the more Africa gets divided into smaller bits and pieces, the more we become insignificant. And, and if you look at the rate at which our populations are growing, at some point in the 70s and 80s, when the, everybody said these are lost decades, you know, for Africa, our population was still rising by 3.2% a year. So look at where we are now. Look at Nigeria, uh, 200 million people. <clears throat> um, if you look into the next 10, 20 years, Nigeria could easily merge with Ghana. Maybe it's too early. But mm -hmm. I'm saying that 
There are two countries Togo. in between us yeah. who speak French. Yeah. So how do we merge? No, it's, uh, what I'm saying is that we could railroad those two countries. I mean, I don't think the president of those so countries... So the point you're making is that the original integration should be taken more seriously. More seriously. More should seriously. be made a priority. Oh, I think so. I think so. I think we are drifting too far apart from regional integration. There were, there were periods in this country where ministers, every, ministers in every African country were designated for regional integration. It's now all disappearing. Mm. And our, our Minister of Foreign Affairs is now called the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration. Oh, but that bit is, you know, it's like a silent one. Mm. You see, it is, I, I, I mean, look at us. When you have China with their population taking over the rest of the world, we are rather splitting into little groups. I mean, what is Ghana? A Ghanaian minister of, with, the, with all respect, a Ghanaian minister of whatever, standing here with the minister of roads or minister of whatever in China, look at the world view. It is so unfair in comparison. You understand? I mean, the portfolio that they handle is far apart. Oh, far apart. And... Look at the guy is looking at the whole world. But, but so, so is the minister for Norway or Denmark or yes, Belgium. Yes. Why are they more significant? But why are they not? Why, why are they interested in European integration? Not necessarily, you know, selling your, giving up your sovereignty. But considering yourself that we are Europeans, economic I mean, integration, which is what they have achieved. Precisely. And yeah. I, you've also seen a new movement, the. Um, European identification. There's a new group, a far-right European group, mm -hmm. that is saying we are Christian and we are, we are, we are white and Christian. Mm -hmm. Ultra-nationalist. Ultra-nationalist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, coming out of, so, but they are emphasizing their Europeanism, that we are Europeans. Look, no matter what you do to Eastern Europe, and they are all, now all consider themselves Europeans, mm -hmm. right? So we should be looking at ourselves. Looking at ourselves as Africans. Somehow, as you talk about the European thing, the, the question of homosexualism is coming up in my mind because I interviewed the Speaker of Parliament and he was quite clear about this position. The conversation and the narrative is, is taking a back seat of the news now, but do you have a view on that, on the acceptability of uh, same-sex marriage? No, I, I don't want to go into that. I think we should look at our culture. It's, it's all culture well, Culturally, we, we won't accept it. Yeah, I think... See, th this is where this is where I have I have a problem. If we do not make culture the basis, or the basic tenet of our of our development, we are only borrowing. You see, it's the but culture the, means what? Culture means polygamy. Culture means many children. No, culture means no, speaking our own no, language but when you, as a means of instruction in school rather than English. Is that what culture? No, means? Uh, it's our 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 own traditional way of life. And you have just said a few minutes ago that we would not accept same-sex marriage. Yes. It's simple. It, it has nothing to do with um, various aspects of, of our living. If our society did not accept it, and if you go to the, your village, can you imagine going to your village to tell your mother that you have a wife of same sex? Oh, I beg your pardon. <laughs> okay. I get it. We have to end at this thing. But just to ask you, do you have J.J. Rollins' permission to do the second edition? Yeah, I do. Well, I, I informed him. And he didn't say no. He didn't because say he no. said no to Professor Kweku Danso for the other day. So that's what I'm asking. You see, the, the, the thing about this book is that it's not a new book. Yeah. It okay. came out in 86. Yeah. So at best. But how did you talk to him to ask him? Did you write to him? Did you call him on the phone? Did you meet no, him? No, I went to him officially to tell him that a second edition of this book is coming out. Um, he didn't ask to see it? No, he didn't ask to see it. And I said it was the same 1986 edition with a few edits here and there, maybe one or two new pictures. And I also added that it was going to be put on stage. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the interesting part. At some point, he wanted to see the, the, the guy who was going to play Rollins mm -hmm. and the guy who was, the, the lady was going to play Nana mm -hmm. So we arranged with and the National Theatre and took them there. I see. And um, yeah, he looked at them, sized them up. 
I remember one girl, the comment he made was, okay, he said, okay, why don't you walk up there and come back? Walked and came back and he said, well, yeah, yeah, you are right, but your legs don't look like Nana Cornelius' legs, you know. <laughs> and then, um, you know, the, 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 the characters have been paired, the mm -hmm. two for each role. Yeah. So the next time the other girl went and he said, well, yeah, 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 your teeth look like Nana Cornelius' teeth. Uh, yeah, you, you, smile, you smile better than the last one I saw. But, but the boy that is playing the role of J.J. Rollins, he saw... Is he a half caste boy? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, he has, he has some, the same features as he had in 1979. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. He's, he's a younger guy from Kumasi, and they are now rehearsing at the National Theatre, and it's, it's exciting. It's, Is JJ going to be there on 31st December? He's been invited uh, mm -hmm. by the Board of National Theatre, so I... I Did you take the opportunity to clarify your issues with him? No. See, again, this is where I separate my, my, my professional life from my literary life. I see. Yes. I, I have never discussed uh, what went on in my political life with him. Because, Did uh, he ask you questions about NDC and, no, and never. why you were not running for president? No, 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 no. He didn't? No, no, never came up. We never talked about that. We, we only talked about this book because at some point, a couple of years back at some funeral in Osu. He had met briefly and he has asked, people are asking for the book, is it coming again? And I said, well, it will come later. But we never discussed politics. We never discussed uh, what, what I'm doing and what I intend doing. Mm -hmm. But he knows I'm running a university and I enjoy doing it. And I, I enjoy my retiring retirement I'm, I'm doing more writing I believe that this is the time to now write a lot more because our people need need to know we need to document a number of things that have happened in this country it's it's sometimes very painful to see people analyzing from a very uh, narrow um, point of view because they just felt a bit of the history but if you happened to be around at the time that I did, and not just looking at the um, the narrow confines of that story, but looking at the generality of the development of Ghana and Africa as a whole, you feel like you must write some more if you have the energy. Mm. Thank you so very much. Posterity is indebted to you for this one. We'll all be at the National Theatre on 31st to watch it. Uh, Mr. Kujanka will be there to sign some copies uh, for you if you get there a bit early. Here's the trailer again. Thanks for watching. Uh, this is part of our Christmas edition of Good Evening Ghana. Good night. A true story that changed the course of Ghana's history, creatively told with music and drama. The trial of J.J. Rawlings. Hello. You better shut up when I'm talking, okay? And the line is now straight. Move! Monday, 31st December, come experience a truly significant moment in Ghana's social political history. Captured in a rich musical drama at the National Theatre, 3 p.m. prompt, and witness the official launch of the book, The Trial of J.J. Rawlings, second edition by the renowned Kojo Yanka. Admission plus the book is 100 Ghana cities. Don't miss a thrilling adventure into Ghana's modern political Political History, Monday, 31st December 2018 at 3 p.m. at the National Theatre. Also showing from 3rd to 5th January 2019 at 4 p.m. and 8 p.m. daily, The Trial of J.J. Rawlings.